in my day, any sniff yeah. of being within a mile of causing somebody even to think that you might be scratching at the edges of doing something that was in contravention of international law would be kicked as far into touch as possible. The whole point of the civil service is to find a way to implement what an elected government wants. Now, I think the problem that we have now is that the consequences of trying to implement what the elective government wants are so horrific for the country, and it is also part of the civil service's duty to point out what the risks and benefits mm. of any given policy direction are, that they don't want to hear it. They don't want, you know, it is, our, it is our job, I say is. Yes. It was my job to point out the consequences and also to point out, particularly with reference to foreign policy, with, you know, with the Home Department, in some ways it's a little different because they have the ability to legislate for stuff within the country. But when it comes to the Foreign Office, you can't tell nearly 200 other countries what it is they have to do. Uh. You have to persuade them. And you can only really persuade them to do things if it is in their benefit. And that is one of the reasons why we were the most effective country within the EU, because we were brilliant at delivering policy across the whole of the EU that benefited the whole of the EU and benefited the UK. And had the UK's right, signature, heart. had the UK's fingerprints all over it. It must be very frustrating to, to see how at odds with what was reported back at home, the reality of what was happening in those sort of scenarios actually was. Well, yes, I mean, I retired in 2016. Mm. I retired within... Oh, no, I retired about a month before... Um, I can't remember the date of the referendum now. It's terrible, June. isn't it? June. This is age for yeah. you. No, I retired I retired just before the referendum. And I, I woke up sobbing yeah. when I heard the results. Because I could see... I mean, if you are a uh, person who's interested in strategy, my final 10 years in the Foreign Office were almost exclusively on international security policy. Gosh. And... You know, the EU, just the biggest peace project that we've ever been involved in. Brilliant for peace across the continent. And there we were talking about, I mean, back in 2016, one couldn't know how dreadfully the government would go about implementing what was, after all, an opinion poll. Yes. And they, whenever there was a bad step to take, they took they it. They took it. It was <laughs> Absolutely astonishing. I remember thinking... Well, it's well, not under it, your analysis. We're talking about ideology coming up against evidence... Reality. Well, yeah, against reality, and the civil servant is caught in the crossfire. How can we be confident that... Because you're, you're, these sort of opinions you wouldn't be able to express when you were still in the job publicly. The, the, no, the, how, how, how can I be confident, let alone somebody listening who is on the other side still of the Brexit debate, if, if such people exist. How can I be confident that this depth of feeling and conviction, however evidence-based it may be, wouldn't actually leach into your work with a minister or a, or a secretary of state like Dominic Raab, who, without a great deal of um, intellectual heft, it must be said, was under the impression that Brexit was both easy and desirable? I mean, how, how, do you see what I mean? There is a bias. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, it is part... One's conviction can easily be laid aside. I was very often, I mean, yeah. goodness me, I joined the Foreign Office in, what was it, 1970? I can't even remember, seven, Gosh. I think it was. I, You know, I mean, I, I think it was, was Callaghan Prime Minister yeah. when I joined. Goodness me. So, you know, there have been... That's a shift. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> there have been governments of every political stripe while I was while I was in the Foreign Office. I was out for a while as well. It wasn't a, a you know, an end to end career. But it didn't matter. No. You you know, if you're clever enough to be doing that sort of work yes. then you are clever enough to put your own views aside 
and use reality as your guide. And that's what the civil service is there for. It's to point out, um, particularly in terms of work in the foreign office, when you are, or when your proposal, the government's proposal, is liable to break international law. And in my day, any sniff yeah. of being within a mile of causing somebody even to think that you might be scratching at the edges of doing something that was in contravention of international law would be kicked as far into touch as possible. It just was not acceptable. So, of course, you wrote in your submissions that, you know, there were, there were, there were problems. There were liable to be problems ahead. Now, most of the time, in my time, I didn't have to worry about that so much because if anything, you know, because the governments that I worked under, none of them, and Thatcher in particular, would have had anything to do with uh, looking at breaching international law. It was anathema. Gosh. I mean, this is a remarkable and UK law. The same. No, of course. Well, I, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I mean, and now they blithely announce in the House of Commons that they're intending to do it, albeit in a very limited and specific way. And of course, oh, Braverman does my head in. Does my head in? It uh, is. I mean, and what that does to our reputation around the world? Can you imagine? I mean, no. the one thing I have to say, and I think we can look at this with respect to the United States. Trump was in for four years, and everything the U.S. did was widely and roundly, um, you know, denigrated when he withdrew from this or argued against this. But you put somebody competent in power and see how quickly it can turn around. If we get rid of this absolute shower and get somebody competent in charge, I actually almost don't care what colour they are. Sure. Politically. But, uh, <laughs> or, or, liter- yeah. or literally. <laughs> well, no, I don't care. Literally <laughs> of course you or, don't. Or, or figuratively. No. What kind Just of competence. That sort of objective competence. Competent and yes. truthful. Uh, well, that you and lead... honest and following those, those um, you, know, you know, the civil service guidelines, the ministerial guidelines, people who can follow those properly. That's what we need. Well, you've uh, oddly you've injected some much needed optimism into your analysis because it was pretty bleak for a while there, B. And and yet the the uh, relative ease with which a degree of normality could be restored is something that many people listening will find very comforting. I uh, find myself despondent, and then I think about the things that can change, yeah. and I knit. You knit. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, there's no. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing quite it, like knitting. But but it is. It, you you are watching an abs- You're watching a a, a, a skip fire. But Indeed. with the knowledge that the fire will burn out at some point, it's just a question of how much damage it does before it does. And that's the thing that worries me most is how yes. much damage will be done before uh, before it can be turned around. Because turned around it will be. I mean, you know, the what was it? The arc of history always bends towards justice, or there's some. Yes. There are many many wonderful yes. things about how we will get past this, but. You know, you look how long it took Germany to get past the Second World War. And I'm not saying, you know, we haven't got bombs flying over London no, or course. anything like that. No, the damage is self-inflicted. But the damage is huge. Yes. Because you have, to turn, you have to turn the rump of the population around to understanding reality as well. And when our public services are across the board... In such disarray, that takes time too. Mm. Without an educated population, how do you get people to understand the, the the consequences of voting for a bunch of charlatans who are busy stuffing their pockets while emptying the treasury? How do you get people to understand that that's not acceptable and persuade them to go out and vote? That's the question for the ages, really. And, and of course, as you fully understand, they're, 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 they're outlets which might help people arrive at these conclusions or come to these realisations are largely complicit in the original um, political plan. Uh, there be, you've made me record-breakingly late for the news. I hope you'll take that oh, as a compliment. So but but allow, <laughs> allow me to read you what Stephen in Milton Keynes has to say about your contribution. He says, you know a caller is blooming good when James just shuts up. <laughs> Oh, sorry, but that also means I never do. No, on the contrary, it means that uh, uh, every syllable was, uh, was unmissable. Thank you.